Okay, members of council, if I can please have you take your seats. Okay, members of council, please take your seats. This meeting is now resumed. Before the recess, council is debating item SC 8.4 on 2787, 2791 Eglinton Ave Avenue East, zoning amendment application. Before we return to that item, we'll review the members' motions. Are there any release of member holds? Okay, MM 10.1. Okay. Notice if this motion has been given, this motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Recorded. Oh, Councilor Peruzza. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Wong Tan, please. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously, 19 in favor. Okay, on the item, on favor of Councillor Peruzza. Well, Yes, sir, Wong Tam, please. Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Thompson, thank you. The item is adopted unanimously, 21 in favor. Okay, we've dealt with 10.2 and 10.3, 10.4. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the General Government and Licensing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All um, in favor of waiving referral? Councillor Peruzza. Well, we're not going to get a quick if you ask for a recorded vote on every item. No. Councillor Thompson, please. That's right. He wasn't here this morning. That's why. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The motion carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Ten point five. The notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Etobicoke York Committee Council. Two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcon Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing 
and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Uh, All right. No. We, we know you're here this afternoon. Councillor Robinson, please. And Councillor Pasternak, when you're seated. The motion carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Yeah. Okay, on the item. You, you could ask on the, on the item, but you don't have to ask record a vote on the referral to Councillor Peruzza. <laughs> Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Robinson, please. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Pasternak, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 22 in favor. <coughs> MM 10.6, notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. Recorded vote. Motion to waive referral carries unanimously, 23 in favor. On the item. <laughs> Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Crawford, please. Councillor Wong Tan, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 23 in favor. MM 10.7, not notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. Two thirds vote is required to waive referral. Quite a vote. You should have been here this morning. Councillor Fillion, please. The motion to waive referral carries 22 to 1. On the item. Councillor Pasternak, please. The item is adopted 22 to 1. MM 10.8, notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral?
Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Robinson, please. Councillor Ford, Councillor Thompson. Oh. <laughs> Councillor Robinson, please. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously. 23 in favour. On the item. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The item carries unanimously, 23 in favour. MM 10.9. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. Yes, I heard you, Councillor Peruzza. He wants to let everybody know he's here. I will, oh. Yeah, I should have. <laughs> Councilor Crawford, please. I should have, I could have. Motion yeah, to waive referral carries unanimously. 23 in favor. On the item. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The item is adopted unanimously. 23 in favor. 10.10. .10. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Economic and Community Development Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Layton and Councillor Fletcher, please. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously. 24 in favour. On the item. Deputy Mayor Minnewan, please. The item is adopted unanimously. 24 in favor. <laughs> MM 1011. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to a referral. On the referral?
Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Perks, please. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously. 24 in favour. On the item. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favour. MM 1012. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. On the referral. Mr. Robinson, please. <coughs> the motion to waive referral carries 22 to 3. On the item. Councillor Pasternak, please. Councillor Ainsley, Councillor McKelvey, and Councillor Bailao, please. The item is adopted 21 to 3. MM 1013. Notice if this motion has been given, this motion is subject to referral to the Economic and Community Development Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. <coughs> Communications MM 10.13.1 to MM 10.13.3 have been submitted on this item. All in favor of waiving referral. Councillor Pasternak, please, and Councillor Grimes, please. The motion to waive referral carries 24 to 1. On the item. Pardon? Councillor Karajianis, please. The item is adopted 23 to 2. MM 10.14. Pardon? Councillor Grimes? Uh, thinking of abundance caution, 10.14, targeting heavy trucks. Uh, being the uh, owner of a company that has large heavy trucks, I think I'll declare conflict. Okay, you'll have to fill out that form too. Yeah, okay. <coughs> MM 10.14, notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. 
On the referral? Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Bailao. Councillor Bailao, can we get your vote, please? Thank you. Does this include fire trucks as well? A motion to waive referral carries unanimously. 24 in favour. On the item. Councillor Crawford, please. Councillor Caragianis, please. <coughs> the item is adopted unanimously. 24 in favour. Ma'am 1015, notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. On the referral. <laughs> Councillor Fletcher, please, and Councillor Caragianis. Motion to waive referral carries 24 to 1. On the item. <laughs> Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Grimes, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favour. MM 1016, notice that this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Councillor Crawford, please. Councillor Caragianis, and thank you. The motion to waive notice carries unanimously, 25 in favour. All in favour of waiving referral? Councillor McKelvey and Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Cole, please. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously 25 in favour. On the item.
Cancer Wong Tan, please. Okay. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favor. MM 1017, notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an alcohol and gaming commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice. You could just ask for the, the motion, not for the notice and referral, <laughs> Councillor Peruzza. Doesn't make any difference. Councillor Montan, please. Councillor McKelvey, please. Councillor Matlow and Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher, your vote, please. The motion to waive notice carries unanimously, 25 in favor. On the referral. Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Karagiannis. Councillor Wong Tan, please, and Councillor Perks, please. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously 25 in favor. On the item. Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Cressy and Councillor McKelvey. Councillor Wong Tan, please, and Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Carroll, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favor. <coughs> MM 1018. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an alcohol and gaming commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice. Is this a nursing home? Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Karagiannis. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Wong Tan, please. And Councillor Fillion, please. <laughs> Motion to waive notice carries 20 to 5. F five. Wait, uh, I'm in favor of waiving referral. There, there's five members of council that don't feel seniors should drink.
On the referral. Councillor Bradford, please. Councillor Wong Tam, please, and Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Bradford, your vote, please. The motion to waive referral carries 23 to 2. On, on the item. Councillor Matlow, Councillor Karagiannis, Councillor Thompson, thank you. Councillor Perks, please, and Councillor Cole, please. The item is adopted 24 to 1. MM 1019. Notice that this motion has not been given a two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Scarborough Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to a Toronto local appeal body hearing has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice. Councillor McKelvey and Councillor Karagiannis, please. The motion to waive notice carries unanimously 25 in favor. On the referral. Councillor Bailao and Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Kergiannis. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously 25 in favor. On the item. Councillor McKelvey. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Kirgiannis. The item is adopted 24 to 1. MM 1020. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice. Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Fillion, please. The motion
motion to waive notice carries. I'm sorry, it does not carry the required two thirds majority has not been achieved. The vote is 16 to nine. MM, MM 1021. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving, waive notice. Councillor Bradford, please. Councillor Karajanis. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Karajanis, your vote, please. Councillor Karajanis, could we get your vote, please? Thank you. The motion to waive notice does not, it carries 24 to 1. I wish they'd stop. Okay. So that didn't carry. Oh, carried. I thought you said it didn't. Okay. Um, on the uh, referral. Yeah, they are set for everything. <laughs> Councillor Balai, Councillor McKelvey, please. Councillor Karajianis and Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Perks, please. Okay, why is everybody so noisy here? Everybody on the right is quiet, the left is noisy. The motion to waive referral carries 24 to 1. On the item? On the item. Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Wong Tam. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor McKelvey, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favor. MM 1022. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. On the notice. Yeah, recording. Until the bells start irritating him. Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Matlow. Councillor Peruzza, please. <laughs> Councillor Matlow, your vote, please.
The motion to waive notice carries unanimously, 25 in favor. On the referral. Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Fletcher. Maybe the mayor can stop Councillor Peruzza. Can Councillor Pasternak, please. <laughs> Councillor Barlau, please. And Councillor Karagiannis. Every item, even the notice. Yeah, I just. The motion to waive referral carries unanimously, 26 in favor. On the item. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Wong Tam, please. And Councillor Pasternak, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1023. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to a referral. This motion has been added to the agenda is before council for debate. On the item. On favor, carried. No, you missed it. You missed the boat. Too late. You sneeze, you lose. <laughs> MM1024. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, recorded. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Matlow. The item is adopted 25 to 1. MM. MM 1025. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda before council for debate. On the item. I didn't hear you. The bells. When the bells are ringing, I can't hear what you say. Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Karagiannis. The motion carries unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1026. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda before council for debate. On the item.
Cancer Wong Tam, please. Cancer Care Giannis, please. The item carries unanimously 26 in favor. MM 1027, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1028, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item. Councillor Layton, please. Thank you. Councillor Thompson and Councillor Karagiannis. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM, <clears throat> MM 1029, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion been added to the agenda before council for debate. On the item. <laughs> Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Bradford and Councillor Matlow. Councillor Fillion, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1030, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item. Councillor Matlow, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1031, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item. Councillor Bailao, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1032, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda before council for debate. On the item. Councillor McKelvey, please. Councillor Matlow. The 
item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. MM 1033, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda before council for debate. On the item. Councilor Pasternak, please. Councilor Matlow, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. Sorry. Uh, MM 1034, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair, this, uh, by the chair, by the chair. Yes. Um, <laughs> this motion is subject to reopening <coughs> of item EX 3.8, a two-thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. Okay, okay, on the reopening, Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Karagiannis. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The reopening is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. On the item. On the item. Councilor Ford. Councilor Karagiannis, please. Councilor Montan, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 26 in favor. Okay, so we'll now go back to SC 8.4-2787-91 Eglinton Avenue East. So we have, um, we did ask the question, so now we're in the speaker's, uh, speaker's list. So Councillor Crawford, you held the item down. So Councillor Crawford to speak. I've just put uh, something on the overhead, if we can have a look at that in a few minutes. Um, perfect, thank you. This development proposal I took over from uh, the previous councillor in the uh, previous ward prior to the election. Um, over the last year, I have been working incredibly hard in, with the spirit of what the community and I think the council wanted. Uh, there were numerous consultations in the area, uh, and that was to have low rise uh, townhomes uh, with a similar density of what is actually in the area on Eglinton Avenue. Uh, which worked out to be about 100, 180 stacked homes. So when you looked at this, and we saw this application uh, about a year, year and a half ago here at Council, um, it's vastly improved from what, uh, what we saw last, uh, last year. Um, there is actually a public park in there, 11, uh, almost a 1,200 metre public park in there, uh, not cash and new. That's incredibly important for that community because there's a deficit in, in parkland out in that area. Um, the park is actually 2% larger than they were meant to put in, which means, again, it, it, there's more parkland to, uh, for the community. I talked a bit about the setbacks when I was going through my uh, questions. Understanding that uh, at some point in the future, uh, an, ex an LRT, the Eglinton East LRT, will be going through that area. I've supported that all along. But when you look at what sort of setbacks are needed, um, and with the questions that I was uh, proposing and asking staff is, um, number one, the five-meter setback that is here, not three meters that was originally, but the five-meter setback, 
actually will not jeopardize the Eglinton East LRT. In fact, what, what staff said is they're not too sure whether it's a 5 meter, 3 meter, 8 meter, or potentially 12 meter, as was discussed. The EA will, will determine that. But they did stress to me that the 5 meter that is here will not jeopardize that. They'll have to figure it out at some point in the future. So the 5 meter was not a, not a concern. With regard to Section 37, we didn't bring that up, but the initial Section 37 amount was very, very low. I have negotiated, I think it's almost three times or four times larger than what was initially proposed. So that, that is also good for the community because that money is going to be going down to be fixing another park in the area. Now, when you look at the density, and I know the density was brought up by a number of the questionnaires uh, on this, um, understanding the de density at this part of Eglinton is different than the density downtown at Young. It's different than the de density um, at Laird. This is Danforth and Kingston Road. When you look at that area, there are similar densities of townhomes in the area. So I don't consider this different. This it actually fits in with what is happening in the community. Um, there was a comment about affordable housing. Then understanding that this is, this is a legacy development that was brought on. If I had started this from the very beginning, the conversations right up from the very beginning would have had affordable housing. But unfortunately, this has been going on for the last two years. I also want to talk, and this, I want you to have a look at the, um, the drawing that is up there. So staff have said um, they want more intensification. They want more density policy-wise with avenues. I get that. I have avenues in my area. I have Kingston Road. I have St. Clair. So I understand the idea of, of having increased density, and I support that. But when you look at the configuration of this lot, now take, I, I put up there the five meter setback. Staff wanted an eight meter setback. So you take that into consideration, and then when you look at the weird lot size, when you add the 45 degree angular plane, the reality is you will get a six to eight story um, uh, mid-rise development. But what wasn't said, and, and again, it's hard to suggest, you aren't going to be getting that much more density than what is actually there right now. There's 180 units. You may get another 20 units with an 8-meter setback on that particular sign. So when you're looking at the overall density, it's not going to be that much more. The community has spoken on this uh, in a number of community consultations prior. As I said, I am here in the spirit of what the community wanted supporting this development and understanding this this there are still a few things in the report that still need to be worked out those will be worked out uh, we've been having some very positive conversations with staff those will be worked out and then the bills will be passed on this but again this is in the form that i think is the best that we can get for that location and for that area of eglinton so of course i'm hoping uh, to get support on that thank you Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion that I would like to move. If I can have it put on the screen. Uh, so this motion is basically taking this proposal back to the, uh, to the staff recommendations. And with the greatest amount of respect to the ward councillor, uh, my ward is, uh, is to the immediate east. One of the reasons that I'm looking at this, uh, I'll say, is, has to do with the Eglinton East LRT. It's on the plans. We always talk about higher orders of uh, transit. In uh, Scarborough, we're trying to get an, uh, an LRT built from the Kennedy subway st station to UTSC. And maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with Eglinton Avenue along this stretch, but if you um, flash forward 10 years from now, hopefully, you will take the Eglinton subway to Kennedy Station. You'll get on the Eglinton East. LRT, you'll go along uh, Ellington Avenue, you'll go through part of Councillor Thompson's ward. Uh, there's a plethora of development applications in the pipeline. Many of them are anywhere from eight to 10 stories, if not taller. The properties are intensifying because of the Eglinton East LRT. That's the impetus for development along Eglinton Avenue. You're then gonna go along to this stretch of Eglinton Avenue. If we support this application today, you're gonna to get townhouses on each side of Eglinton Avenue. You might get more strip plazas, which are there today. If we pass this today, instead of the strip plazas, you might get more stacked townhouses. You're gonna go further along Eglinton uh, into my ward. You're gonna get a lot of apartment buildings between Markham Road and Kingston Road. You're gonna go further along Kingston Road through my ward 
along Kingston Road today, I have 15 applications sitting there. Developers are waiting for the LRT. They're telling me as soon as the shovel is in the ground for the LRT, they're going to start putting their projects forward. You're going to finish at UTSC Scarborough, where we had a partnership with the university where they built the Pan Am Aquatic Center. They're still waiting for the Eglinton East LRT. The problem is right in the middle. If we start putting forward and supporting projects like this, where we don't have the ridership, we're never going to have the density on Eglinton Avenue to build an LRT. This proposal, as staff, as you've heard from staff, it goes against the Avenue study. It goes against the provincial policy statement of 2014. It goes against the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe of 2017. What we really need here is what uh, Councillor Crawford alluded to. If there was an eight meter setback that staff are supportive of, we would have a six to eight story building. That's what staff have always asked for. That's what they've looked for. It's the reason why when this first came forward, former Councillor Berard Netty, they were completely against it. What we have today is another application. Staff are also completely against it. What's changed with this application? There's actually lower density. There's more parkland. But it's, from my perspective and from the planning perspective, this is a project, we're not moving forward on our city planning on Eglinton Avenue, we're almost going backwards. So we really need to delete the recommendation in the report, go back to the city uh, recommendations and move forward on this. And I know that some people have talked about what this area looked like 20 years ago or what the proposal was 20 years ago. We have townhouses. <laughs> We have townhouses right across the street from this proposal that were built, I think, 15 years ago. I don't know the exact timeline, but it was certainly when we weren't discussing an LRT on Eglinton Avenue East. When this project, there's some talk that 20 years ago that the, a developer wanted to build a higher project, a more dense project on this property. City staff weren't, weren't told about or didn't want to do it. Well, that was 20 years ago. Once again, when 20 years ago, when we were looking at what to do, we were fighting over a subway versus the SRT in Scarborough. We weren't talking about a higher order of development along Eglinton Avenue East. Here we are in 2019. If we're going to move along with city building in Scarborough, a high, looking at building the density we need for a higher order of transit, I, my recommendation, we need to take this back to the drawing board and, and revisit this application. And I'd ask for your support. Thank you. Councillor Fillion. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say at the outset, I don't intend any of my comments to be uh, critical of uh, Councillor Crawford. I know he inherited the situation from the councillor who previously uh, represented the area, and uh, there um, are very few few of us who, if an applicant wanted to build something that was lower density and the community wanted to build uh, something that was lower density would say, no, I insist on it being uh, bigger and higher. Um, having said all of that, the degree to which this is much smaller than the staff would have um, liked to see is fairly uh, extreme. It's at least um, half as small, if not more. Um, and I mean, the other issue is especially, and I say this to the Scarborough councillors, um, if you want bigger transit, you really need to know that bigger buildings go with that. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much inescapable. Um, this, when this first came up, it was uh, at our last meeting of the last term, and there were two very unusual planning issues before us at that meeting. Um, there was one in former councillor De Bearmaker's ward where the councillor asked us to approve a 34-story building where the staff were saying no more than 16, so more than twice as big as what the staff thought represented good planning there. 
and then the one in Councillor Holland's ward, this one, um, less than half the size what uh, the planning staff thought it should be. And um, in both cases, um, council went along with the local councillors. And um, those decisions obviously weren't based on any kind of planning merits because one was twice as big as it should be and the other was half the size it should be. There was no consistency whatsoever. And although I sympathize with the local councillor and normally vote with the local councillor, we really have to be very careful in here about making political decisions in place of good planning decisions. And it uh, doesn't just affect this site. When we do that, we have no consistency. We lose our credibility. Uh, we make the job of the planning staff who are trying to ensure some consistency a lot more difficult. And especially when we're trying to uh, plan a city that can, where we can accommodate more um, density and especially um, some assisted um, housing, some um, at um, along transit corridors, we really need to be careful about not making political decisions and making good planning decisions. So for that reason, I'll be supporting Councillor Ainsley's motion. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Normally, I don't, I don't talk on planning items in other councillors' wards. I rely on the local councillor to do what's best for his local community. And, and what... Who, who's making snarky remarks over there? Um, but in this case, I, th I think it's important to speak in favour of the local councillor and the proposal uh, before us. Uh, everyone is crying for uh, extra den density, but I've taken a look at the uh, footprint of this uh, development. And basically with uh, restrictions on the angular plane and, and the configuration of the, of the site, it would be almost impossible to get anything more than about 24 uh, more units. At the same time, uh, should this be rejected by council, there's almost no doubt that the applicant will go to the OMB. And under the current uh, regulatory climate, we're almost certainly to lose and lose badly. We will almost certainly lose the park, and we will also almost certainly lose the Section 37 benefits uh, that are tied to this. I should remind councillors that back in the last council, there was a four or five story residential building at the Lawrence, uh, the Lawrence West uh, subway station that came, came forward. And we were astounded at how, uh, how low the density was in an active subway stop. But this council approved it because of the reasons I've listed. Because they relied on the, on the knowledge and expertise of the local councillor. They realized that the property owners were not going to build anything more and that they'd lose badly at the OMB. I think it's best in this situation that we rely on the local councillor, we support what's, what's in front of us, and we do what's best for the City of Toronto. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll, I'll uh, address uh, uh, Council from, from here. Uh, I've got an angled uh, uh, 3D of the, the site we're looking at. There's the site right there. And there's Eglinton. That's the home of the, uh, the future Eglinton LRT expansion out to the Scarborough U of T campus. Uh, there's the there's the density that uh, that is nearby and so when I look at it and you do when when you see a refusal report from planning in my neck of the woods uh, uh, residents are often disappointed why is planning going along with this we're taking so much density um, uh, how much density how high would it have to be to get planning to refuse it and, and historically, that would be the reason. This is too dense. This is more than we, we can possibly absorb. Um, and, and, uh, and so we're forever looking at, we have 22 stories, we have 34 stories, we have 43. 
fought all the way to the provincial divisional court, but 43 has become the norm because we're talking about, in my area, Shepherd Avenue East, where we have ambitions of expanding the Shepherd Subway. I'd be happy, I'd be happy just to, to expand it LRT out to the zoo. That would already be open now had it not been cancelled. Uh, but now that it has been cancelled and there's opportunity for a second thought, the proposal is that it could be a subway. It would run through my ward and on through uh, Councillor Karagiannis. So we're getting this second opportunity, but there's a sort of a social contract that goes along with that. It may now be a subway, the thing that people had wished for all along. Won't be, it won't be done till 2041, but that doesn't stop the applicants along that avenue from saying, so we'll put in, we'll put in residential, we'll put in employment, we want density because it is coming. On this corridor, on Eglinton, we have people saying, well, they want a, a car like that one. We have people meeting in rallies and libraries. I, I attended one myself. The new councillor, Councillor McKelvey and Mayor Tory in attendance, were raw rawing and making sure that the province knew we must prioritize that expansion out to the Scarborough U of T. And here we are in what would be whether it's Midland or Brimley, it's perhaps the second or third station that would be on that expansion. Our chief planner is trying to make the statement that if you want that expansion, you have to contemplate the density that puts the ridership on it. And planning community, development community, can we have that conversation? But as council, we're saying we don't want to have that conversation. And, and I appreciate that, uh, that this is a legacy issue. It's not the current local councillor that, that started the community dialogue that put us in this position. But unfortunately, I can't cast my vote on that basis. I can't, because I feel bad for the current councillor, I can't cast my vote on that basis. I need to know that the chief planner has taken a position and can use that position as ammunition to say any time he goes to the LPAT, we get our official plan. We are trying to put density around the avenues where we have said to the other order of government, the province, we want higher order transit here. We're prepared to put higher orders of density here because we want you to fund that transit. I can't say to the residents of Don Valley North, nor could Councillor Karagiana say, uh, it must be a subway, not an LRT, but no, we can't have density. So we had. Absolutely accepted, Madam Speaker. I'll bet you're about to ask me to apologize, and I do, and I do. That being said, that being said, I can't say, I will not say, to constituents who eat 43 stories time and time again because they so passionately want their subway. I won't say to them, but they can have higher order transit a decade before you get your subway, but they're not taking density. I can't say that. So I'll be supporting Councillor Ainsley with all due respect to the local councillor, sincerely. Sometimes we toss that phrase off, but I actually do have great respect for the current local councillor. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. Others have already talked about how we got here and, and how the, the current councillor is in a bind, and I, I, I agree with those remarks and endorse them wholeheartedly. But I want you to return, to return your minds back to before lunch when we were asking questions of staff. I asked the chief planner, what would the impact of approving less density along a transit corridor that is in our transit plans be? And he said uh, it would undermine the performance of that transit line. There will be fewer riders, we'll, we'll make less revenue, the, the line will lose money. When the TTC operates a line that is losing money, underperforming, that means there's less money in the transit system to deliver service across the city. Or it means we have to increase property taxes to provide further subsidy. In other words, this decision will cost money that we don't have for, to, for our ability to deliver transit in the City of Toronto. 
It is fiscally irresponsible, and it also undermines our ability to say that we have a credible transit plan, something which, frankly, uh, the provincial government is already using against us. We undermine our ability to say that we are serious in our transit planning and that what the Torontonians want to have, have elected us to, to get built shouldn't be taken seriously. Somebody else's idea is better. It reinforces that notion that you can't trust government to build transit, which is a horrifying thing to be doing. So, we're undermining our own transit plan. We're undermining the fiscal future of the TTC. But more important still, when we make decisions that run contrary to the official plan, it gives everyone else who is making a development application in the area, or anywhere in the city for that matter, the ability to go to the Ontario Municipal Board and say, well, you don't have to take this kind of issue that's in the official plan seriously because Toronto City Council doesn't take it seriously. We have very few grounds that we can use for negotiating with a developer. We can talk about the Places to Grow Act, the official plan, and the provincial policy statements and our official plan. Those are the only things we can use when we're negotiating to try to make better development in the wards we represent. And frankly, the official plan is, of all of the cards in our deck, the strongest one. Every time we vote on a development application that undermines the goals in the official plan, we weaken that card. We make it easier for developers to have their own way with us on every future application. The chief planner, when asked about this, said, yes, this does create a risk that other applications in this corridor can come in and not conform to the secondary plan or the official plan or any other planning policy that we put in place in this part of Scarborough, and it strengthens their case that we have done this. So let's review. The transit, if we build it, will not perform well. We will spend scarce dollars for bad outcomes. We will then have an operating deficit that we somehow have to pay for. We will weaken our, our negotiating position with the province and other people in the, in the public dialogue around what kind of transit we want built by making ourselves look foolish. We will undermine our ability to deal with similar developments right across the city, but even more particularly in Scarborough, where we keep telling everyone we want more development and more transit. This makes a mockery of every debate this Council has ever had on the urgent need to invest in Scarborough in terms of public transit. I am shocked, frankly, I am shocked that we are here doing this at all. We should be taking the advice of the Planning Department. Councillor Perks, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson, you are next. Um, and I apologize, the speaker needed me to be here. You probably won't be able to use my tablet because I'm over here and it's can, over uh, there. Can I bring it to you to basically put your password in and then I can... And then run like heck. <laughs> here, let me just... I, I gotta hold your time. Thank you very much. Here we are. I appreciate it. There you go. You're, you're back in biz. Okay. Oops, is your pen? Yeah. <laughs> All right. There so, you go. There you go. You. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yep. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, most days I would agree with uh, Councillor Perks and others who have uh, spoken uh, and, uh, about this particular matter. I, I would also agree with staff most days. However, it appears that what we're actually talking about in terms of when we talk about density, we're talking about 18 units in an area that has approximately 17 uh, high-rise condominium and, and uh, rental units. You can see most of them there, but there are some to the uh, east, which is a top right and going over to McCowan, there is a senior's residence, 
as well as further at Trudell and, uh, and Bellamy, there are a number of uh, mid-rise units. The location that we're talking about, which is Danforth and Eglinton, Mr. Linton indicated that um, they're looking at about uh, a six to eight story mid-rise, and the number of units that we'd be talking about is about 200 units. The number of units that's being proposed for this particular site is, as I understood it from the local councillor and the C plans, about 182 u units. Uh, so the difference is about 18. Right now, we're under capacity in terms of transit to accommodate the residents who live in that area now and uh, realize it's gone out there. At the shorter building at the northwest uh, corner there, that's a, um, that's a no frills. Hopefully in the future that will in fact be a high rise development and perhaps going to the west at uh, Bell Brimley and Eglinton. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that Council Perks has indicated that we're undermining our transit plan, we're undermining our, 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 our official plan, and yes, the staff does not agree uh, that uh, perhaps that the uh, townhouses that are being uh, proposed would be a good thing. But I remind you, we're talking about 18 units, and in fact, the residents to the south there have worked really diligently with the local councillor, the previous councillor before, and the current councillor, and have agreed that they would, they would support um, a townhouses there that would be about 182 units, whereas Mr. Lintern and others has uh, sort of indicated that eight stories will probably give you uh, 200 units. And so we've heard that, well, this is a mockery. We've heard that this is totally contrary to what uh, our plan for transit is and so on. I disagree. Uh, in another scenario, perhaps if you didn't have all of those uh, uh, condos and, and rental property there that are now deficient of transit and are in need of transit on the north side as well, you see you have all of those townhouses, a lot of people living there who are in need of transit right now. So at this particular location, the normal criteria that we use should not be utilized because in fact it's underutilized now and we really need to ensure that we have certainly a transit there, but also keeping in, 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 in with the character of the local community, I think this is actually a good thing for us to do. We ought to support the local councillor, and I would not support the motion that's been put forward by Councillor Ainsley. I ask members to support the local councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Karadianis. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm standing to uh, encourage my colleagues to uh, listen to the local councillor. We all seem to know our areas very well, and we all seem to be experts about Toronto. But there's no better expert than the councillor that has knocked at every door, has talked to every constituent is there there, and that councillor has the best interest of his constituents at heart. If he or she doesn't, well, the next election, they're not going to re-elect him. So therefore, uh, fellow councillors, I urge you to support the local councillor. This is something which is very dear and important to him. He's been working very hard at it. So I'll be voting along with Councillor Crawford, and I urge you, the rest of you, to do the same. Call the question. No, you can't do that at the end of your speech. Okay. Well, there's nobody speaking so, after me. Well, Who's there now? somebody will. So it looks like this, that was the last speaker. Can we ring the bells? Okay, we have we have one motion by Councillor Ainsley. It's on the screen. Recorded vote.
Counselor Wong Tam, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 8 to 15. Okay. On the item, on favor, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The item is adopted sixteen to seven. Page 4, T8.77, poll regarding maintaining or removing permit parking on certain streets. Councillor Bradford, you held the item down. Do you have questions of staff? No questions of staff. Really? Okay, does any, can we clear the screen, please? Does anybody have any questions to staff on this item? Okay, Councillor Bradford to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'll be very brief. I uh, held the item down as I knew uh, Councillor Purse wanted to raise some concerns and I'll let him speak to those. But basically this is a request for a poll on whether we should keep or remove permit parking on 32 streets in Ward 19. Um, this has been prepared with consultation with our city solicitor, uh, with parking and uh, clerks. And uh, the streets that are in question had been introduced uh, into permit parking in a unilateral way without the polling. So this process is just coming in place to give people an opportunity to vote on whether they want to have permit parking or not have permit parking. And hopefully we'll avoid, uh, you know, removing streets out of the system or introducing streets in the system. This is the cleanest way to do it. And uh, appreciate staff's help in, in working on this with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm going to encourage you to vote no on this item. I have never been a fan of the polling process. Uh, you'll know that uh, I've fought long and hard to try to get it eliminated from all of the decision making here at Toronto City Council. I worked with Councillor Holliday on getting it removed from uh, the, par the parking pad system, and I would love to see it gone from everything else. Our polling system is anything but a fair test, a proper test, or an accountable test of what the public thinks about a given item. I, every poll we do, we struggle just to get the minimum response rate required. We, we often will get response rates 20, 30, 40 percent and not make the threshold of 50 percent of the people responding. As well, every time that there's been a poll done on a controversial item, somebody in the community comes forward and says, I didn't get my card, or the card that I got uh, was addressed to someone who lived here eight years ago. Further, our polling system doesn't establish any kind of prior arrangement about what the correct boundaries for a decision like this are. It's completely arbitrary and just seems to be tailored to suit whatever uh, some people in the neighborhood or the local councillor feels is the right group of people to ask the question of. And remember, this is about using an asset that is available to every Torontonian for parking on or driving through. We're actually talking about a public benefit that belongs to everyone and setting up a very arbitrary boundary for who gets to give us advice on how that public asset should be used. Further, as many of you will have experienced, if people are not satisfied with uh, the outcome of a poll, they'll come back to you two years later and say, let's do that again. I have a street in my ward. I think I'm on the fourth attempt by members of the public to launch a poll about where parking should be on the street because some members of the community 
are just not satisfied with the outcome. So we have a terrible mechanism and we're using it instead of we as the elected officials making a decision. Here's the other thing about polling that is on this item that I think we really have to have our minds clear on. The bylaw does not give any existing permission for a poll to be done to remove permit parking. What Councillor Bradford is bringing to you here is a, a one-off saying, I have a complicated problem, there is no polling procedure for dealing with it, so I'm going to ask City Council to invent one. It is literally inventing one. We went over this with staff advice at Toronto East York Community Council and I asked them, is there anything in the bylaw that says you can do a poll to remove permit parking? And the answer was no. So at the risk of giving you bad ideas, the precedent we're establishing here is any time a local councillor gets into a jam on any issue, they can just bring a motion to council and say, why don't we do a poll and I'm going to draw the boundaries for that poll. Got a tough development like Councillor Crawford did? Why not just poll people? Why not just spend a little bit of public money on a flimsy mechanism which is not properly democratic, not properly monitored to get me out of the jam? And I know Councillor Crawford would never do that, it's just you were the last item. This is not how we govern. This is not the kind of precedent we want to establish for us doing the job that we took an oath to do. Finally, we need to remember that even if the poll comes back, even if the poll comes back, we still make the decision. The polling pr pr procedure does not mean that the outcome is whatever people voted on. The authority to make the decision still rests with City Council. We're not only running a very, very poorly organized and very arbitrary system for canvassing public opinion. We're not only creating a precedent here that can allow, would allow a city councillor to you know, run, a, run a poll on any issue that they feel like at any time. We're also misleading people into thinking that it's their decision. It's never their decision. It's always council's decision. No matter what the poll says, Councillor Bradford is going to have to come to Toronto East York Community Council and move a motion yeah, thank you, Councillor for what he wants to do, it, which is what he should have done in the first place. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Sorry, Madam Speaker. I'm, I, I'm back at the overhead projector. <laughs> um, these are the polls. Um, all due respect, Councillor Perks, your speech was very passionate, except you kept using the word poll, singular. And there are 44 of them, all being asked to be, to be done simultaneously. Uh, to me, it's a, res a resource issue. It's a queue-jumping issue. Um, we keep just hurling things at transportation. Uh, escalate Vision Zero, do this, do that, in all four service districts. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that, that this just doesn't seem like something that should just come here and, and not actually follow a manageable course, few polls at a time. Each poll requires staff then to act on its results. And that is, it's highly unusual to ask them to do this 44 different times, all in one motion. I, I suggest that, it, that uh, we take this whole motion. It's not that long. It's not that far away. If we're going to do local business in this way, let's just refer it. It'll only take a couple of additional months to refer this to budget. Budget uh, uh, process 2020 is on its way before us, and their staff can tell us if this new way of doing this sort of universal approach uh, is expedition, uh, expeditious and is sensible, maybe they'd like to tell us how much it would cost to change to this type of bulk practice. I'd be happy to hear, and, and then maybe that's the way we proceed. But Councillor Perks comes at it from a Toronto East York Community Council passion about permit parking. 
I'm just coming at it from a resource issue and wondering how much more we can heap on transportation. Thank you. Okay, on the item, the items before us, recorded vote. Councillor Perks, please. Councillor Cressy, when you're seated, please. <coughs> and Councillor Layton. The item is adopted 18 to 5. On page 4, CC 10.1, School Crossing Guard Program. <coughs> Councillor Maltlow, you held the item down. Do you have questions to staff? I do. Uh, does anybody have questions to staff? <coughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, to you, Madam Chair. Um, I've heard reports uh, that there have been some cases where um, crossing guards, locations where there once uh, were two crossing guards, coming, okay? now okay. only have one. Sorry. Now only have one crossing guard, um, and I and I've heard that in particular. And please correct me if I'm wrong, and I hope I am. At, at the corner of Mount Pleasant and Eglinton which uh, where uh, we have a, a public school, Eglinton Public School, right at the corner, and uh, condos being built all around it, and then, uh, and then the Metrolink LRT project uh, right outside its front door. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, is it true that, that that is happening? And I want to determine, and at least ask you to look into it if you don't know the answer, whether or not this is just a budgetary decision or if it's a service-based decision. How is this being considered? Through the speaker, there are a few locations citywide where there's more than one crossing guard that was assigned through the Toronto Police Services Crossing Guard Program. Historically, there are no set and fast rules as to the threshold for why you would have multiple guards. Uh, the location that is uh, that you're speaking about at Mount Pleasant, my understanding, currently has one guard, and we are in the process of looking into uh, if there's an assessment method that we would apply where multiple guards might be necessary. But to, the, but to the point of it, once having two, and then one being let go. Sorry, please go ahead. No. If you need to talk. Three, Madam Chair. That location does have two guards. However, with the existing construction that is currently in place due to Metrolinks, there are no conflict points currently. Every turn, there are no turn movements allowed at that intersection. Yeah. Therefore, to put two guards would be overutilized so there is still one guard that is still there and the second one as the changes occur back so there'll be another there one would be once the intersection goes back to a normal condition okay so 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 that that is comforting here so it was more of a service base rather than solely a budgetary it has not been removed yeah. okay that that is that is that is good to clarify and I appreciate that number two could you clarify um, the criteria that is considered for assessing whether or not a crossing guard should be allocated in the first place. Uh, there, there, there still seems to be a lot of confusion amongst councillors and the community about um, exactly how, you know, some people would say, I want a crossing guard at every corner uh, on every street. Um, there are some places that really would merit it based on a number of factors. How do you ensure that you are fairly assessing it and how do you determine that? Through the chair. Um, we are now, the, there was a method that was being used by the Toronto Police Service, and I believe it was basically a gap analysis review of if there were enough uh, clearance zones allowed for the pedestrians right. to cross. We are now implementing what is uh, a new criteria that was developed through the Ontario Traffic Council for 
uh, school crossing guard locations. It is a method that's been derived by all municipalities in the province of Ontario, so we're implementing that. And it's based on an exposure rate. So it, it looks at a combination of how many children are crossing the street, whether they are um, attended with their parent or they're attended or unattended with an individual. Plus we look at the conflict points, which are the vehicles and the turn movements that are being made. And based on that criteria, we are also look, that's how we're going to develop, as well as how close they are to the school in question. You just said something that, that if I heard you correctly, is, is wonderful. So the the police the police had a um, they had a criterion uh, where they would assess they would go out and they would assess uh, how many uh, unsupervised children would be walking to school and that, and then they do a snapshot they go out there and they do a snapshot of how many and then they'd assess whether or not they met the the criterion the problem with that always was that um, it was it was sort of a vicious cycle or, or chicken and egg scenario where many parents wouldn't send their kids unsupervised because they didn't believe that they'd be safe enough to cross the street, so then they never meet the warrant to be able to get it. So are you saying that's no more? So what we're doing is they are both counted. Obviously, unsupervised children will get a higher weight. Okay. But both are equally, they are equally included in, in the, the overall review. So we don't leave out um, accompanied children. And then how is there, is there a community meeting? Is there a discussion with the principal school council? How do you go about consulting with the community? Some of the pieces that we've added as transportation has taken over this program are to ensure that any application for a crossing guard is both a canvas to both the local counselor's office and the principal because in most cases, as you know, principals have, a, have somewhat yeah. of a plan and they understand their community. Um, in terms of modifications to the warrants, we haven't necessarily, we've gone to TDSB and had a lot of conversations with them yep. about changes to the system. Uh, we will always go out to community meetings when people are interested, if parents are interested in sort of hearing about uh, modifications to the system, we're happy to come out and talk about that. And how are th uh, the, my last question is, uh, since Councillor Fletcher took the leadership on that, ensuring... That was your last question, sorry. Okay. Councillor... <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Pasternak. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff, uh, we've had some hiccups as the, as the uh, new uh, regimen of, of school, guard, school crossing guard program uh, has launched this fall. Now, I'm looking at the chart here, and is it safe to say that 132 uh, existing guards that were with police services have given their notices and have quit under the, the, the new... Um, program? Uh, through the speaker, that's correct. We did, uh, with the contractors, the two contractors who have uh, won the contracts to deliver the crossing guard services for the city, uh, they contacted every TS TPS guard that was uh, on their roster multiple times in some cases, and uh, of the um, number that existed, uh, 132 of them opted not to continue. Now, at the same time, I see that um, 74 are unreachable. Um, they, they never answer the phone. They never return the calls. So through the speaker, there was uh, a significant number of existing guards who uh, either take the summer out of town. Uh, in those cases, we worked yep. with the contractor to ensure that they would fill spaces temporarily until they could connect with every TPS, former TPS guard directly. But uh, it was not... Um, it was not as straightforward as just making initial contact to people. They spent a good chunk of the summer uh, diligently contacting everybody who was on the TPS roster. Is, is there a possibility that we were given a list that was grossly out of date, that had uh, dozens of names of people who had long ago left uh, this position and we were just given those names as sort of Filler. We use best possible data that we received directly from the police. We use the police's lists. These were people who were getting paid by the police as crossing guards last year. And so we had, uh, the, it was the best possible information that we had. Uh, our, the contractors also did a, a fair amount of research to ensure they had the right phone numbers and in some cases mailed registered letters to the existing guards to ensure that they were at least contacted. So the complaint, it seems that if there's a a, a, a location where a crossing guard doesn't show up, the complaint actually goes through the city. The complaint and then, goes... And then it's redirected to the vendor. Is the, that... 
the, yeah, the complaint goes to the city, but there's immediate contact with the vendor, so I don't know if you want to talk about that anymore. Through you, Madam Chair, yes, that's the case, sir. Um, they will call us in, depending on how it goes through 311. When we get, when we receive that, we are automatically doing our own due diligence uh, based on the software that the, the vendors have in place uh, that allows for the guards uh, to actually check in that they were there, and if we don't see it, we actually reach out to the vendor to ensure and determine what the issue was, and also to ensure that the very next shift, which usually is the lunch shift or the afternoon shift, depending on when, whatever shift was missed, they will guarantee to, or ensure to the rest of their ability uh, that a guard will be present. So uh, it, it seems to me that the vendor's bench uh, is pretty thin. They don't have a deep bench for sort of a tier two sub team to come in on short notice. Would that? Would that be a, sh a fair observation at this point? Um, at this point in time, the intent of what they had provided or agreed to through the, the bid process was uh, a 10 percent over capacity, which when you're looking at approximately 708 guards, it would have been uh, they needed a total of 70 guards to have extra that would cover. What's happened since the beginning of the school year, between a combination of either existing TPS guards have decided they no longer want to partake in the program and are resigning or retiring, or uh, the new guards they've hired have gone out a couple of days and decided they don't like the job. So they're leaving, and it leaves them with a vacancy that even with their 10% their over capacity, they are still having a hard time. So it's, it's been a bit of a, uh, a struggle. Um, well, I think they have a they have a pretty significant yeah. bench, but the bench has been depleted and now needs to be built back up again. So they're okay. in the process of doing that. Okay, fair enough. Um, just on a regulatory uh, in a regulatory framework, can um, parents, um, I guess, volunteers at the school throw on a vest, pick up a stop sign, and help children cross? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, for anyone who uh, wants to be taking on the responsibilities of a school crossing guard, they need to have the, the proper training. They need to have the security uh, screening as well, too, the vulnerability screening um, in advance of them being able to go out there. So it's, it's not a fair statement to say that just any parent could go out there uh, on their own. Thank you. Councillor Matlow to speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I don't have a motion to move because uh, this, the transition seems to be going very well uh, from what I see and what, from what I hear. Uh, and I actually just want to uh, stand and, uh, and express some gratitude. Uh, first of all, uh, to uh, Barbara Gray and her team, who under, uh, you know, any transition is incredibly difficult and complex and confusing at times, uh, but I believe that they've taken this very seriously and certainly the feedback that I'm hearing from the community is that uh, things are improving rather than declining from how it was before. Uh, I want to uh, also express my, uh, this is another occasion where I'm sort of going to put on my parent cap along with my counselor cap uh, to the mayor and to council. Thank you. Like, thank you so much. This is, there's nothing that replaces adult supervision uh, when it comes to the care and the safety of our kids. Um, and I just, I've, I see it firsthand. Like many of you, I know many of the crossing guards in our community and I know what they do for us and it wouldn't happen if it wasn't for you. And I really, really am appreciative, appreciative of the, um, you know, not just talking about how important it is, but that you have demonstrated that support and it means everything to us. Um, and to the crossing guards, you know, I actually named a playground after uh, Mona Piper, uh, who uh, was Toronto's longest standing crossing guard uh, for over 40 years. Uh, at the corner of Foreman and uh, Manor Road, which is now, it was in my ward, and it's now in Councillor Robinson's ward. And uh, we named a playground for Mona, and I think it was appropriate to name a playground after her because uh, the kids loved her. And not only the kids loved her, but then they became parents, and then their kids loved her. Uh, she, she supported two or even three generations of kids in, in our Davisville community. Um, and I've gotten to know Dave in the new part of my ward over at Hillcrest at Nina and Bathurst, which many of you know, I know the mayor is aware of it and others, uh, that is a dangerous intersection and we are now, you know, with the support of Barbara Gray and her team, going to be able to get a, a red light camera there and we're, you know, making significant improvements there. Uh, but any of you who uh, 
you know, know or love kids who go to Hillcrest and cross that street every day uh, will get to know Dave. And Dave goes out there and he puts his body and his voice in front of every everyone to, to fight for those kids. He, it's not a job for him, it's a calling. There are a lot of Daves and there's a lot of Monas out there. Um, they, they, are, they are taking care of our kids. And I guess to just say it plainly, as a parent, um, is there anybody more important than them? Is there anyone doing anything more important in the city than them? I don't think so. So I love them and I really respect the work that they do. And I really, really appreciate the work that, again, the mayor and council has done to move this forward and for Barbara and her team for making sure that it's done well. And the things that I heard earlier about the improvements in the criteria for just bringing a more rational approach, a more sensitive approach to just how to arrive at a, at a good conclusion uh, makes a lot of sense and it's you know due to the thoughtful work that you've obviously done to uh, to assess what what the right way to do it is so thank you very much everyone Councillor Councillor Fletcher did you want to speak yes I just wanted to uh, just quickly because it is four o'clock and we do have a hard stop uh, just to again thank uh, Ms. Gray and her staff for really quickly uh, shifting gears once we realized that all the crossing guards who were currently employed by Toronto Police Service hadn't really been carefully uh, contacted yet by any of the providers and it was very quick. The police did step in to let them know what was going on and to my crossing guard Al who said I don't know I, I want to stay with these kids I want to stay at this corner and we don't have anything to do that so council stepped in I think in June and all the staff got together there are some real upgrades with this current system including there are phones and if they don't have a data plan the providers I believe are giving everybody a phone so that they know they're there in the morning or that they have to call in that's a pretty big step up from somebody not turning up somebody then has to phone the local police division somebody has to go from the police division and head out to whatever corner it is so that that basically there would be no crossing guard there for the morning maybe even into the afternoon for school so it's a thought I mean that this is what these people do they provide crossing guards it's not off the side of a desk it's their main job so thank you very much for taking into account the idiosyncrasies of these positions the uh, people that have been in these positions and faithfully serving the communities for years and understanding that they're very varied these are not wealthy citizens that are working they are humble working people who are doing their best looking after the most vulnerable citizens of our city which are our children so I just do have to big shout out to all that you did to get this back on track and up and running to start for school thank you Okay, Councillor Robinson, briefly. Yeah, briefly? Yeah. Okay. We, I, we want to get the agenda complete. So. Okay, yeah. thank you for that advice. Uh, I have a motion. Um, the very first motion I moved this term was related to crossing guards and getting an update on that because it wasn't, as uh, the chair indicated, a smooth rollout. And so um, it was actually Councillor Matlow's uh, daughter's school that were one of the you know serious um, uh, school communities that were very concerned about the lack of uh, traction on this program so I am also uh, standing up to thank staff for their hard work in rolling this out I know it's been very challenging it was a big undertaking we we knew that last term this was not going to be easy um, and it was a bumpy start but we're getting closer I'm moving a motion just to make sure there's some touch points on training because I have had some feedback that not all the crossing guards out there are, are um, at a star status. There's a number of them that are, um, but we have had reports that um, some of them could use a little more training. So I understand you are doing that at the onset, but I think there's with some particular um, staff positions uh, and some of the players they could use more extensive training. So that's feedback based on uh, my school parent communities. And so I'm simply moving this motion to make sure there's some more touch points in the process to ensure that they're up and running. I think one school crossing guard is, uh, one really effective school crossing guard is actually, can be even better than two. If somebody, as Councillor Matlow was 
indicating is so passionate and committed to the job. And so I think as long as we have them, you know, as long as they're very well trained and they're effective and they're committed to what they're doing and, and on some level passionate, I, I think we can't go wrong. So again, thanks to uh, the Transportation Division for your hard work on this. On the motion, all in favor? Carried. Item is amended, all in favor? Carried. Page 5, CC 10.3, legal challenge to Bill 5. Councillor Matlow, you held the item down. Do you have questions to staff? No. No. No? Anybody? Councillor Perks. Uh, thank you. I've, I have questions for the city solicitor. Uh, so a number of people have contacted me asking about, uh, you know, how the case goes forward here uh, and if we have the right expertise and does the city have the ability to bring in outside expertise if necessary. And I was wondering uh, if you had any comments on that set of questions. Madam Speaker, first of all, I would like to say that I have complete confidence in the in-house legal staff who have handled this matter thus far, and in my view, they are the best people available to carry it forward to the Supreme Court of Canada. That being said, there is, there is nothing that would prevent me, nothing in a prior council decision that would prevent me from consulting with outside legal if, uh, if I thought that was necessary. So that would be at your sole discretion. We yes, don't have to give you any direction to do that. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you. Councillor Mallow, did you, ha did you want to speak? Yeah, thank you. Um, just, before, uh, just before a summer ago, uh, we, I, we were, most of us were in this room. See, many more of us were in this room. <laughs> yes. And we were, we were shocked. Uh, we, we had just heard, uh, without any consultation or any discussion by the Premier or the Minister, that a decision had been made uh, to uh, virtually cut council in half, cut the wards in half, uh, ignore the lengthy and uh, deliberate process that we went through to determine the number of wards in consultation with the communities and advised uh, by an independent consultant. They threw all that out. They just threw it in the trash bin and went their own way. And I think many of us ended up in situations, I ended up in a, you know, what I would describe as like a gladiator ring with Councillor Mahevic, which was unfortunate and really traumatic, I think, for all of us. Uh, and each of you have your own story of how difficult that experience was, up against friends, um, finding yourselves in situations now where you represent double the population, double the geography. When, okay. I, when, okay. I know, when, I know, when I know that all of us want to be at those meetings and involved in the communities and at that table supporting people at their doorsteps, in their parks, in the communities, that's what I love about that job that I do, that I'm privileged to do. To not just show up for a moment because I've got 10 other things I've got to do that same evening, but to be there through the evening, to be there, to be involved, to be supportive, uh, to arrive at solutions. Because that's, that's what we're all here to do. And this unnaturally large-sized wards that we represent now are not good for democracy. They're just Absolutely. not good for local democracy. Um, the wards were cut in half, but the workload wasn't. If you're the kind of counselor who does your job, you know that. You know it's true. So um, we found ourselves in that position. But then it, you know, it, it made me think about you know, what is the role of counsel. If, if the province can just unilaterally decide to just cut an election in the middle of an election, again, whether, you know, as the mayor said, you know, whether you like 25 or 47 or whatever, the principle of sort of doing it in that way, I think, I think, you know, offended a lot of people in Toronto. Um, and then what about our land use planning uh, rules with respect to uh, uh, our, our OPAs and Bill 108? And what about, um, you know, funding, ongoing funding for things like childcare and health and, and other priorities? And 
we're just going to keep finding ourselves in the same situation. I mean, I, I could go, we, we could list through all the different issues that we work on, transit, housing, uh, subway upload, like, the list goes on. Back to when the mayor, you know, supported moving forward with uh, uh, tolling our, our highways to support infrastructure and then finds out at the last minute that it's not, not going to happen. We have a broken governance structure here and we need some answers to what the role of a city is in the Canadian context. Cities in the United States have home rule. They have charters. Um, they, they, they have authority, most of them, many of them have authority over land use planning, finances, and governance, such as elections. In Canada, to, do, to, to have a charter, it wouldn't mean uh, uh, opening up like a Meech Lake kind of debate or 10 provinces or a certain percentage of the, prov of the, of the population. It would only mean the province and the, and the federal government agreeing. And if we had a better provincial government and we kept a, a federal government that would work with us, uh, it could happen in three years if we did the work now. But the reason it's important to test what happened to us with respect to the election all the way to the Supreme Court is because we need answers. And I, you know, I think the mayor and I are in complete concurrence on this, that whatever the answer is, there ne we need to define what our role is, how we make decisions. We need precedent cases that actually set the standard for what the law of the land is, because there's a lot of confusion and ambiguity now. And then if we are happy with it, so be it. And if we're not happy with it, then we know that we have to advocate towards a charter so that we have real authority to do the things that our residents expect us to do at a level of government that has the highest level of expectations and yet the least amount of power. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, during the last campaign, we started with uh, 47, and then right in the middle of it, we were cut down to 25. Um, for whatever reason, that's water under the bridge. However, we went to court, we lost. How much more are we going to be going back at it and back at it and back at it? What is it going to cost us? The amount of money that this is going to cost us, can we not use that kind of money for somewhere else? It's not that we have the legal staff and it's infinite. That is going to cost us thousands of dollars. So why are we pursuing a matter which is foregone and it's over? There's no way that we can go back to being 47 in this term. And next term, if we're going to go back to being 47, we'll be another government that might want to set us there. But all of us are doing the work. And to hear that this is an extended and a big ward and you can't handle it, well, you know, I'm sorry, but that's, that's, that's nonsense. And if you can't handle it, guess what? Step aside. There's a thousand other people that are ready to look at, to take over your job and do it. And some of them might do a better job than we're doing right now. So for us to sit here and, and even ha just even think about this and having people sending emails to us, that's a waste of our time, a waste of our money, and money that we can use in daycares, money that we can use to fix the potholes on the roads, money that we can use to fix our sidewalks, and that list is getting longer and longer oh, stop and longer. Stop yelling. Stop yelling. Thank you. You're not welcome. If you can't hear my voice, then you don't have to sit beside me. But Madam Speaker, in the, you know what? I've got the right to speak, and I'm speaking. But That's my tone of voice. But you don't have the right to be that rude. That is my tone of voice. And you Madam don't have Speaker, the right to be rude. I'm not being rude, Madam Speaker. You are rude. You're Madam a bully. Speaker, when I have, a, when I have a, 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 an individual beside me that's trying to sidetrack me from what my I'm thoughts not. are, I'm you sorry, but I disagree with that. And I'm not screaming at you. That's my tone of voice. I think we're wasting our money and our time. And when you stand up and you say, we want more money for daycare, we want more money to fix our roads, well, guess what? Here's an opportunity for us to do the right thing. That's over and done with. Let's use that money to fix our roads. Let's fix that money to, to, to give the daycares that we need. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Councillor Fletcher. I'm not going to scream, Madam Speaker. I'm just going to speak quietly. But uh, there are so many people around the world that envy our democracy. We are so lucky we can vote. We are so lucky the structure that we have. Millions and millions and millions of people don't have access to democracy. And we feel that our access was denied by overturning a 
democratic decision of this council that we planned for, that we had funding for, in order to have a representative democracy and not federal and provincial size wards doing business that we know is very particular. We have to visit constituents. We have to look after trees. We have to look after roads. We have to look after crossing guards all around the schools and see that they're there and take emails. This is a very different job than an elected MP or an elected MPP. And I think we're finding that these are, this is an onerous amount of work for many of us in these new wards. So I simply, uh, I would know, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Councillor. I just want to thank the staff for doing a great job, our legal staff, both when we first had our first case, when it went to the appeal court, because a 3-2 decision, I think, means that not all five judges were convinced that Bill 5 was the best. And going to the Supreme Court, we have other people who are partnering with us. FCM, of which we're a strong member, believes in local democracy. And I think they're going to be there with us advocating for local democracy. So I say let's get on to it. Let's make sure we try to get a decision as quickly as possible so we know what our future will look like and our constituents will know what our future will look like. I've received thousands of emails up to today asking me to support this motion, support a strong legal case at the Supreme Court. So I'll be voting for that. Okay, last speaker, Mayor Tory. Um, well, Madam Speaker, um, the main reason I want to get up and speak is just to say thank you and uh, to commend our legal staff because uh, whatever people's views are uh, on uh, the issue, and I know there was a difference of opinion in this uh, chamber over time when we dealt with this at the time it happened, uh, I think that uh, our legal team uh, at the city, and this is an important point through you, Madam Speaker, for Councillor Claire Janice to recognize, which is that th this has been entirely carried by our own legal staff, so the actual out-of-pocket additional cost has been zero. There has been some allocation of time, but I think it's an allocation of time on a very, very important point of law, and that it, important enough that two judges in the Court of Appeal uh, wrote very strong uh, dissenting judgments uh, to indicate that they thought it was important, and that is why I think it's also important enough to take the same case um, to the Supreme Court of Canada. But the out-of-pocket costs have been very little, uh, but the expertise, uh, the competence uh, of our legal staff has been highlighted uh, by this, and I just want to say thank you to uh, the city solicitor and to her staff um, for the excellence that they have uh, demonstrated in taking these arguments forward. The, the city solicitor's opinion, and as you'll recall from, from the early days of this a year ago, um, was that this was a monumental uphill struggle. Um, and anybody who studied five minutes, let alone uh, several years of law or practice law, would know uh, that what we're dealing with is an 1867 document uh, that sets out responsibilities and very much makes a huge, sophisticated, democratically elected a uh, government like this, uh, a creature of the province, subject to being changed on a whim uh, anytime anybody wants. And that's not right, um, and it's not up to date in its thinking. And so if you ask me the reason, uh, through you, Madam Speaker, that I would say to, uh, to Councillor Karajanis or anybody else as to why it's important for us to take this to the Supreme Court of Canada, which Council has already instructed in any event uh, some time ago, the first reason is that I think that if you looked at the, the really fundamental point that the dissenting judges uh, spoke about, I think very eloquently, was the notion of changing the rules about any election in the middle of the election. And I mean, anybody who doesn't think that uh, was something that went beyond uh, proper behavior, let alone legal or constitutional behavior, right in the middle of the election. It's pointed out in the judgment that we were, I forget the number of days, 69 days from election day when the rules were suddenly changed. And, and the candidates were different and people who'd spent all kinds of time and money on issues were uh, suddenly sort of told they were no longer really able to participate in the race in the same way. And I think if that precedent is never followed again, that would be a good thing uh, worthy of establishing uh, on the record. But the second thing that I think is equally important about this, and I've said this publicly many times, is that I think for purposes of cities across the country, including the city of Toronto, but not limited to the city of Toronto, the more we can get intelligent reasoning on the record, even if it's in a dissenting judgment, about how far this power that the, federal, the provincial government has under the Constitution can go, what limits there might be in terms of reasonable behavior, we will find there will be a day coming. We may not be here, but somebody else will be, or it'll be in some other city, whether it's Edmonton or Vancouver or Montreal, and we'll be very thankful that the Supreme Court of Canada, if they choose to hear this case, had the opportunity to 
bring their intelligent, uh, their intelligent judgment to bear uh, on this matter because I believe that we are dealing today with a document that was written in 1867 and if somebody was drawing it up today in 2019, there's no chance they would draw it up this way, not even the slightest chance. But as, as uh, Councillor uh, Matlow, I think it was, said, nobody's suggesting we have Mish Lake and open up the Constitution. No, there's no appetite for that. So this may be the best chance that we have to get some reasoning from some very distinguished jurists about that power and how far it should go in 2019 as opposed to 1867. So for that reason, plus the fact that, that I know that our legal staff will distinguish themselves and therefore distinguish us, uh, in the cause of taking forward what is a very important point on the narrower point of democracy and what rules you can or should be able to change in the middle of an election, but also on the broader point of where there might be some lines that you might start to draw around this kind of seemingly limitless power of the provincial government to do anything that affects a, a big, uh, complex city like this. Uh, I think this is uh, well worth our while, and the cost, as we've seen, for I think you pay a filing fee or something is a few thousand dollars, uh, which I think is well worth doing on our behalf, but also on behalf of other cities across this country, uh, who I think will very much value, uh, if it's heard, uh, the judgment of the Supreme Court in this matter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. On the item, recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. The item carries 20 to 4. Okay. Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Do you care about a single other city? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring this onto the floor because the affordable housing program, the latest iteration, which uh, began in 2014, expires at the end of the year. And it's important to resolve the matter over these uh, hundred. I guess a combination of affordable rental and affordable ownership units. Okay, on um, favor carries, so we'll be circulated. Uh, page five, CC 10.9, Council Wong Tam, you're ready to release your item. I know there's been a banned circulation of your motions. Madam Speaker, that is correct, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I would like to move the, uh, the, uh, the content that's uh, contained in the green paper that's been circulated should be sitting on, uh, on all the councillors' desks, uh, and also to adopt the confidential instructions in the staff report with those amendments, um, and uh, and then everything else on purple paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do the the green one first. Okay. On favor. Carry. On the confidential. On favor. Carry. Item as amended. On favor. Carry. Councillor Fletcher, page five, MM ten point four. You held the item down. Refreshes it, and also they'll come back with a report about anything else. So I'm going to replace the recommendations in the MM with oh, the ones that... Does the staff have the MM? Yep. Oh, no, they have it, yes. They do. They have it. There it is there. And there's the new recommendation. So it remains so that the uh, East York Rotary and then to also look if there's anything else to report back through government management. Okay, so that's uh, MM 10.5 on the amendment. On favor, carried, item as amended. I'd like a recorded vote, please. Recorded vote.
Councillor Matlow, when you're seated. Councillor Wong Tam, please. And Mayor Tory, your vote, please. The item as amended is adopted unanimously, 25 in favour. Our last item, our last item is the me member's motion that Councillor Pasternak just introduced, so I believe rather than wait to get printed, I think if we just seen it on, can be, review it on the screen. There it is on the screen. Are you okay, Councillor Perks? Okay, on the motion, on the motion, on, yes. Can I speak on this? Uh, Madam Speaker, this is uh, a situation that we are, are going to have to create a policy uh, with the city. And so I'm going to move this. Uh, this refer this item to the chief planner, chief building officer, uh, to report to the next executive committee. So uh, I'm going to ask the indulgence of council to refer this item to the next executive committee. And uh, I've committed with a local councillor, and uh, the mayor's office and I will work with the local councillor to make sure that we bring a solution to this, but that we also create a policy, an overall policy, that uh, we're not going to deal with these cases case by case, but we actually have a standard policy that is going to allow affordable housing to be built in the city, and that we're not dealing with this on an ad hoc situation. And, um, Okay, Councillor, we will work with you to make sure that, uh, that this comes through, but we, it's really important that we have a policy created and we're working hard. And a uh, meeting is already in the works to, to get this done with our uh, a CFO, city solicitor, and chief planner in the mayor's office. And we'll work with you to, to get this done. Yeah, just so I just ask your indulgence to have this referred to executive. It is before the November 1st date, so we'll, we'll bring this back. It is, be well, the next executive, it is before. We can get this done before the November 1st date. Sorry, but we've already moved rep uh, referral. We already passed it. So the only thing you can do is that you can ask for a report, but we've already moved it when Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Perks? On a, on a point of order, Speaker. Yes. Uh, my understanding is what we did is vote to introduce it as additional business. We did not have a vote on waiving referral. Yeah, as an urgent business. Yes, so now we have the right to refer it. We never, ever, as a council, voted on whether or not to refer this item. Put it on the agenda. And to be clear, to be clear, when we voted to introduce it, we were not given the full motion. We were not given a full explanation of what issues are at hand. We were only told that it had something to do with an affordable housing project. And I don't think that the procedural bylaw would have been written in a way that City Council can't deliberate on whether or not an item needs to be dealt with now, now or in a month without having seen the item. I would also remind you, Speaker, that there is a provision in the procedural bylaw that when one or more of the uh, issues in the procedural bylaw are in conflict. It is the speaker's right, if I could just have your attention, 
It is the speaker's right to decide how to manage that conflict in the rules. Okay, we'll put it to a vote then because we did introduce it and we did waive referral. So let's put it to a vote. Yeah, that we waive it, waive uh, the, um, the referral. We've already added it because we said it was urgent. So if you want to reverse what we just did, move a motion and we'll reverse it. I'm afraid that, uh, that I'm going to have to like, continue my point of order for a moment. Yes, it is true. We voted to introduce business. That is absolutely correct. Just as at the beginning of every meeting, we vote to introduce the business from various committees. When we vote to introduce business from committees, we retain the right to refer the items from those committees. A vote to introduce is not a, is not a consideration of the question of whether or yeah. not we are referring the item. Councillor Perks, the motion is on your desk. Look at the motion. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. Exactly it's my right point. It's right there, and it's before us. It was never subject yeah. to a vote to yeah. waive referral. We did. We voted on it. Okay. Yes. Perhaps the clerk or yourself could advise us to, as to what options we have because I just want to stand and make uh, strenuously agree with the point made by Deputy Mayor Councillor Bailao because what this is doing is it is establishing a precedent um, and it's all about the November 1st date and it's a precedent we will be sorry we established without a proper consideration of a policy that could apply to other developments that have the same concern about development charges. And so I think if you could advise us as to what our options are, and maybe there are none, but, but I can't believe there wouldn't be an option for us to somehow have this end up somewhere where it could be deliberated upon, perhaps uh, before October, November 1st. I think, in fact, if it got to the executive committee, we could then take our time and do this properly and establish a precedent or a policy that is proper and uh, acro applying across the board. So I would ask for your advice or the so, clerks on that. So what we can do, which the clerk recommended, is we can take a vote now, a recorded vote, on, uh, on the referral okay that's that's the only that's the only uh, alternative that we have here okay okay let's just take a vote counselor yeah well we're gonna vote uh, to refer or not just like we do with the members motions so if you don't want if you don't want to introduce it we'll no for the referral then it will go to committee Yes, so we'll go to committee. I still have a question of the movers in doing that. It would go to, yeah, it would go to executive. I still have a question of the movers. Oh, Councillor Carroll? I still have a question of the mover because this whole thing has come to us. Uh, we're in discussion, so I can't go back and ask staff. I. I understand you're wanting to take it to a committee to, for, for deliberation, as, as the mayor has outlined. Is it your understanding from staff that there will be some, um, there will be some consideration for the fact that, count, that the councillor brought it to your attention here now, even though this can't be ratified by a council until after November 1st? Because the fact that it will then be after November 1st can't be the reason the answer is no. The reason has to have everything to do with the deliberation and executive and not the fact that it will then be after November 1st. So it can be deemed urgent so that it happens before, before Halloween. Because it is here, because you are clear, this is the third time on an affordable and social housing uh, uh, application, this exact same thing has happened. Okay, so why don't okay, we take a... Okay, thank you. Let, let's, no, let's just take a, a recorded vote, please. Let's just take a recorded vote.
Okay, recorded vote on recorded vote, please. Yes. To waive referral. So you vote no. You vote no. Not not to waive referral. You vote no on this. Yeah. Okay, it's on the screen. But why didn't we? Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Wong Tam, when you're seated, please. The motion carries unanimously 25 in favor. That's why I said let's just take a vote. The problem the problem was that the problem was that we had all we had voted to introduce the members motion so it was before us and that was the problem. Members, before I ask for a motion to enact the general bills, okay, please, can I have some quiet, please? Members, before I ask for a motion to enact the, gen uh, to enact the general bills, may I have a motion regarding the consideration of submissions on zoning bylaw and official plan amendments? Councillor Crawford. You have a motion? Oh, dear. I, I had it. <laughs> Cleaned his desk. I cleaned my desk. You'll have to reprint it. Okay, but the committee and council considered submissions in making a decision on the zoning bylaw and official plan amendments. That's what I'm moving. Okay, um, all in favor? Carried. Councillor Ford, you have a motion to introduce certain bills. Yes, Madam Speaker, that we be granted to introduce bills 1276 to 1359 and 1365 to 1384 inclusive. Shall we be granted to introduce these bills? Recorded vote. Councillor Thompson. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Bailao. The motion to introduce the general bills carries unanimously 25 in favor. Shall these bills be uh, passed and declared as a bylaw recorded vote? Councillor Ainsley, please. And Councillor Ford. Councillor Grimes, please. Councillor Pasternak, please, when you're seated. Councillor Crawford, please. And Councillor Wong Tam, please.
The motion to enact the general bills carries unanimously 25 in favor. Councillor Fletcher, you have a motion to introduce the confirming bill? Yes, yes, I do. If when it's on the screen, Speaker, yes, I do. We'll get it. We'll get it for next time. I think it's before you on your desk. It, it could be, but just like <laughs> Councillor Crawford, I think the dog ate my homework. There it is. Um, that Lee be granted. To that <laughs> leave, leave me granted to introduce bills. <laughs> One, four, three, five. Pardon? One, no, two, it's four. not. It's that. One, two, okay, that can, I have, right be granted. can I have councillors take their seats? We haven't finished voting. Councillor Bailao, we haven't finished voting. Councillor Ford took it. Yeah. Um, we still that, have votes. That leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council meeting 10 on October 2nd and 3rd, 2019. Did you read it correctly? Shall leave be granted to introduce this bill, recorded vote. <laughs> no. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Pasternak, please. Councillor Ford, please. Councillor Pasternak, your vote, please. The motion to enact the, or sorry, to introduce the confirming bill carries unanimously 24 in favor. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw? Recorded vote. Councillor Pasternak, please. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Back. Okay, and Councillor Perks, when you're back at your seat. The motion to enact the confirming bill carries unanimously 24 in favor. Okay, thank you. Meeting adjourned. Okay. We're going to make it to the airport. I'm so glad. Have a good weekend. Bye. See you Monday. Yeah. A little person.